what is the mission that God has given us? And we've highlighted that it is the ministry of reconciliation. That is the calling that we have today, that we go out, we don't sit back, we don't relax, we use any tool we can so that we can execute the mission of the Father. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. Here we are again for yet another beautiful lesson. As usual, this is the Marvelous Believer Show. It's always a pleasure to be here. It's always so exciting, so refreshing. And so even today, I know there is so much in store for us. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being with us. Uh, keep the live chat alive. Let us know where you're watching us from and share the link with someone and let's enjoy the word together. This is the Marvelous Believer Show. I'm your host, Lucy Lepore. And uh, tonight we have uh, Eric in the studio and I believe there is something God has in store for us. Let's just allow him to take over so that uh, we redeem time. Hallelujah. It's good to see all of you. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Depending on where you are watching us from around the world, it's just good to have this session with you, the marvelous believer, to just interact on the things that our King Jesus has accomplished for us. Isn't it a wonderful thing to, uh, to just meet and talk about the things of the kingdom, the matters of the kingdom? So today I would like us to focus on something that we have touched on before, which is the mission of the believer, the believer's mission. I like the areas around the, the mission of the believer because they inspire our lifestyle. They inspire what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. These are things that inspire what we wake up thinking, the paradigm of thinking in our minds. How do we organize our thoughts? We have to organize our thoughts in such a way that we are aligned to the mission that we have come here to do. We have already established some of the things that Jesus has already accomplished for us. For instance, we know that Jesus disarmed the powers of uh, the, the devil. We know that he exposed the devil and he disarmed the devil. He even made a public spectacle of him and triumphed over him on the cross. We also know that he helped us to understand the nature of God. We know that God is love as a result of Jesus coming. He revealed to us that we can have a relationship with God that is based on love. Wow, what a wonderful thing to just understand our God, God deeper as a result of Jesus coming into this world. And we also know that Jesus left us an immense mission, which is called the mission of reconciliation. He started reconciling man unto God. He initiated the mission. In fact, he already laid the platform for man to be reconciled to God. Uh, but I, I would like to just mention that reconciliation is not an event. In as much as Jesus achieved uh, what he came to achieve, in as much as he accomplished the work on the cross, he finished the work on the cross, reconciliation to God is a continuous process. It is a continuous process. So which means we have a role to play in this journey of reconciliation. And I would like to just read quickly uh, our anchor text from the book of Second Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. From verse 17, it says, If anyone be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19. And God was reconciling the world unto himself in Christ, not counting men's trespasses against them. He has commented us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20 says, Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God was making an appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And the last part, which is my favorite, says, God made him, him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we may become the righteousness of God. I want us to just focus on these five 
five key key verses that highlight the mission of the believer. And when you look deep into this text, what what is it talking about? There are a number of things, and I know you've, this is not a, a new message to any marvelous believer out there. You've read this text, you've heard different versions of it, you know, you understand what is it to be an ambassador of Christ. I may repeat just a few things that you've heard, but I would like to just dissect it from a different perspective so that we see it from from a different kind of a revelation. So uh, in terms of what is our core mandate, this is a question that rings a lot in my my head. What is our core mandate? What is our mandate as a believer? It is possible for you to live a life as a believer who has given your life to Christ, but that life is not productive, that life is not victorious because there are certain things that you have not done. There is a certain mindset that you have not adopted. And so you set your lifestyle in a way that doesn't conform to the full potential that you are supposed to achieve as a believer. So I like the, 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 the analogy that is being given here of us being ambassadors of God. You know, we are an emissary. We are like diplomats. We are living in a foreign world. This is not our world. This is not our home. This is not the place that is our ultimate place. And you know, uh, the Bible is very clear that when we give our life to Christ, we have already passed from death to life. So we are now living an eternal life. So the life that we live on earth is part of the eternal life. You know, it is part of the eternal life. So we have a longer life to live, but we have already crossed from death into life. So we have been guaranteed of the life that we have been given by God. So we are now living a life that doesn't have an end. It might have a transition when we sleep. But for now, we know that we have been given and guaranteed eternal life. Wow. We have been justified before God. We have been forgiven all our sins. We have been rescued from the bondage of sin. And now we we, we have even been forgiven of, I dare say, our future sins so that we can be guaranteed 100% of this eternal life that God has guaranteed us. So the Bible calls us ambassadors. It calls us ambassadors. We are ambassadors of God. We are representatives of a different kingdom. Yes, we are here in this kingdom. We are walking around the earth, but then we are a man on a mission. We are not just people who are here to stay. We are not here as residents of the world. We are ambassadors. We are men on a mission. And it needs to be very clear, just as it was clear in the mind of Jesus, what is our mission? Clarity of purpose is key for every believer to live a victorious life. So we know that we are in a foreign world. We know that we are living here temporarily. And we also know that we are men on a mission. We are ambassadors of reconciliation. I like that part, how how, how it comes out, like the core mission that we have as ambassadors of God is to reconcile men unto God. So God is using us as tools, as elements, as as ambassadors, as his emissary to bring reconciliation between him and mankind. He has this big plan of reconciling mankind to himself. And we are the people that he has chosen. We are the people that he has elected to partake of this mission, to spearhead this mission. And I would like us to just think about this a bit deeper. If you think about reconciliation, what comes to your mind? So I know if you are in Kenya, some of the things that have happened to us in the past are very clear to you. Like, for example, in 2007, 2008, we had this uh, presidential context, context that content that uh, you know went off, and it got to a point where you know there was post-election violence, and at some point, the two principles that were leading in that elections had to be brought together. You know, in the process of reconciliation, they even brought in some people who are very well known diplomats from outside. For example, good luck, Jonathan came, you know, some of us know that Kofi Annan came, and they did a very good job. People that were warring communities, people that were meant to be enemies, people that, you know, they had every reason based on how they perceived the world. They had every reason to be enemies, but now they are being brought together. 
there will be enemies to be reconciled so that they can be together, so that, you know, they can think alike, so that they can be friends again, so that there can be peace. There can be all the benefits that are associated with reconciliation. In 1994, when there was um, um, a genocide in Rwanda, you know, there has been this journey of reconciling the communities that, that were, were affected by that genocide. You know, you killed my, my mother, you killed my brother, you killed people that were close to me, but I need to see you as a friend. I cannot see you, I cannot continue to see you, your family, the generations that are coming after you as enemies. I need to reconcile with you. And they have come up with a lot of measures, you know, to bring people together, reconciliation. The other last example that I can give on what reconciliation is all about, I know we, we understand in Kenya there has always been, there's also been historical land injustices. And there have been a lot of committees that have been established, you know, to establish a process of whoever thinks things are unfair on this side and someone else is thinking things are unfair from another direction. These people being brought together so that they can be reconciled because of this process of reconciliation. So it is the same concept here that God is pushing down to us and he summons it as the ministry of reconciliation. And when when Jesus was achieving all the things that he did, I like how he called it the will of the Father. He summed everything that he did. He summarized it to the will of the Father. He did reconciliation. He exposed the works of Satan and who the devil was. And he also revealed to us who God was. But all this, he summed it as the will of the Father. So reconciliation is part and parcel of the will of the Father. When people who would not be enemies, you know, are brought in together and they are made, who are supposed to be enemies, they are made to be friends. They are brought together so that they can think alike. So sometimes I, 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 I read things, you know, Kenya is also known for a lot of memes, a lot of funny things going around. And one time I encountered this meme that was, you know, describing somebody getting to the judgment seat. And when they're in that judgment seat, you know, they are all tense and they are wondering, how will I be judged? Of course, they have some things they are hiding behind and they are hoping they will not be brought to light. And then some of their friends start calling them kiongozi, you know. They start calling you kiongozi. You are in judgment, you know, you are waiting for you to, you are very tense, you don't know how things will go. And then people start calling you kiongozi, like you are the person who was the, the ring leader in whatever things that you are doing, which obviously from this context, they are not necessarily things to do with God. They are not things of God. So they are, they are almost like saying you are the ring leader in those things. You know how easy it is to be distracted by the things of this world, by the matters that we encounter every day from the mission that we have been given. And I would like us to quickly look at a, a, a verse that says that, you know, do not conform to the patterns of this world. Do not put, conform to the patterns of this world. I would like us to read a verse from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 2. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We are living in a context where the pressure of conformity is very high. The pressure of, you know, uh, inclining towards the things that we've always done is very high. It is possible for us to find ourselves having conformed to the patterns of this world, to the things that are flowing, being caught up in the flow of this world. So you lose track of the mission that you have. You lose track of what you're supposed to do at the back of your mind. You know, somebody was telling me about this KGV, KGV agents, you know, the agents from Russia, the Russian version of FBI. How at some point during the Cold War, you know, they went to America and over this time, you know, they, they started, they were supposed to infiltrate the systems of America and try and understand how they work 
so that they can this information can be used as part of the winning strategy in the Cold War. So they come in, some of them are coming in as very little babies, but they have been coached. They have been coached. They've been told, you know, when you go there, live a life as though you are a full American. Marry, have children, you know, uh, live your life as though you are, fu- you are fully belonging. You belong there. So they go in and, you know, they live a full life. They even have children. They even buy land. They are involved in all manner of deals. But deep down, they are agents from a different territory. They do not lose focus of their mission. So I want to ask you, my brother, how many times do you consider the kingdom business as part of your daily lifestyle? You know, this is the mission that we've been called unto. This is the mission that we have been assigned the Ministry of Reconciliation. It has to be embedded as part of our lives. It has to be part and parcel of what we do, of who we are. The Ministry of Reconciliation. Is it part of how you live your life? Or have you conformed to the design of the things, the flow of the things that are happening? You know, even in the way we talk, even in the words that we use, it is possible to be caught up in conformity and then we lose track of the mission that has been called unto us. So I would like to just read from the book of Romans. Chapter 5, verse 6 to 8. For at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely would anyone die for a righteous man. Even though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God proves his love to us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, we are coming from a background where sin dominated our lives. We were bound by sins. We we were enemies of God by our very nature. By the fact that you are a man born from the lineage of Adam, you have the sin nature inside. You had the sin nature inside you, but the moment you gave your life to Christ, you know the fact that Christ had already died for you. You are relieved from the bondage of sin. While we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of God, Christ died for us. And I like how he says, you know, very rarely. Would anyone die for a righteous man, even for a good person? It is not easy to say that you are going to die. It is not easy to say that, you know, I I would like to die because uh, so that I can save a good person. Even if they are a good person, you would rather keep your life because people generally love themselves. You do not want to die even for a good person. But then Jesus is dying not because of a good man, but he is dying for a population that is bound by sin, that for a population that detests God, that has been alienated from God, people who are enemies of of God. And when I think about this element of, you know, dying for a good man, sometimes I think about Peter. I like to think about Peter, you know, from the book of Matthew 26, where he, he was having this conversation with Jesus, and Jesus is about to be crucified. And Peter is coming in and you know, insisting that you will not, I will not leave you. He says, I will not leave you. You know, he says that, you know, when, when others desert you, I will not desert you. He's almost saying that I can die for you. You are my friend. You are a good man. I have known you to be the best teacher, you know, the best person. But when the litmus test came, when the real test came, we know that Peter denied Jesus three times, you know, very rarely would a man even die for, 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 for a good person, you know, even for a righteous person, somebody might dare die, and Peter dared, you know, he tried to die for what he called a good man, but along the way, when the rubber hits the road, he realizes, ah, no, 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 I cannot go that route, and he denies him blatantly three times, you know, And then I wonder, what manner of love did Jesus have that he decides for people that are sinners by nature, I will die for them. So 
The first part of this is the mission that we've been called unto. What is the mission that God has given us? And we've highlighted that it is the ministry of reconciliation. So the second thing I'll mention here is um, in terms of how would we do this? How are we required to achieve this uh, mission of reconciliation? So uh, sometimes, you know, people like to go the classic way that has been highlighted in the Bible many times. You know, you pack your bags and you go out. You pack your bags and you take everything that uh, you need for the mission and you prepare, you, you raise all the resources that you need and you go out to the mission. It is a very good thing to do that. You know, it yields sometimes instantaneous results. But then there is the element of the lifestyle that we live. Every day, there is where you are. There is the context within which you are living. Today, as we speak, probably you are just from a game, you know. You are maybe playing football, basketball, badminton, any game that you are playing. There were people that you are interacting with there. Today, you are probably just coming from your workplace. Today, maybe you are a student. You are just coming from school. You could be anywhere. There is a context within which you are living. You could be, you know, coming out from hanging out with friends or even having fun. God wants us to embed the ministry of reconciliation in our lifestyle. In as much as he is interested in us, you know, going out there and preaching the good news, one of the ways that he wants us to reach out is using the lifestyle that we live. Let your light so shine unto the world so that the people around you shall see you and they shall glorify your Father in heaven. People shall see your light shining and this light will illuminate so brightly that they will glorify your Father in heaven. You know, sometimes I'm interacting with people and I see opportunities for myself to, 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 to hide who I am in Christ. You know, some of these situations that we put ourselves in they present scenarios where you are almost torn in between revealing the Christ in you or hiding the Christ in you. So what I'm saying is that God wants us to use these opportunities instead of hiding, being ashamed of the gospel. We reveal who God is, you know. We reveal the mission that he has called us unto. We can also do this with our actions. Our actions sometimes preach. And one of the ways that you can live a life that is followed by a trail of miracles is by living a lifestyle that speaks to the mission that God has given you. You can be, be shocked at the number of miracles that follow you by your lifestyle. You know, sometimes I, 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 am, I meet people and they give me testimonies of how my lifestyle has impacted them. And sometimes I wonder, where is that person? I, I would like to meet them. I want to meet that guy that you are talking about. But then I realize that it is because I don't have to speak for my actions to, you know, to, to preach the gospel. Your lifestyle is a tool that you can use in the ministry of reconciliation. Sometimes we are caught up in situations that, you know, they are not speaking to, to the, the calling that we have been called unto. But the Bible is Im, Im, imploring us, you know, to live in a manner that is worthy of the calling that we have received. Hallelujah. So. The other thing is, you know, sometimes I look at when there is an emergency situation, like some people don't like to see the, the, the message of the cross as an emergency situation. But that is exactly how Jesus saw it, how he managed to do these things within three years, how he managed to accomplish a lot within three years of ministry. It speaks a lot to the character of Jesus and how he saw this as an emergency situation. So sometimes when, when, when uh, you know, people start making all manner of excuses why they cannot preach the gospel, why they cannot reach out, is because you, you don't like, see the urgency with which Jesus sees the need for salvation. You know, our life has not been assured how long our life is. We don't know for sure, for sure, how long you're going to be here. But most importantly, you don't know how long your brother is going to be here. You know, uh, I'm moved to say this, but today I just witnessed somebody being knocked off by a car and they fell down and I don't know whether they knew Christ or not. Of course, people will be left rioting. People will be left, you know, uh, crying and doing all manner of things to, 
try and, uh, you know, justify the situation and seek justice here on earth. But then what about the message of the cross? These people that are, are, are dying every day, do we see it as an emergency situation that needs an immediate uh, intervention? So that is why I say, any way you can, you know, in an emergency situation, that is the method, the, the, the message that is always preached. You know, do not wait for the perfect way to do things. Do it any way you can, you know. Sometimes you can choose to get right into the fire and grab some two people and come out with them. Sometimes you can throw a rope, you know, and whoever catches that rope, you 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 pull them out. Sometimes you can come with a fire extinguisher machine and you, you put off the fire. But anywhere you can, whichever way you can, you need to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation. It is an emergency situation. We have to see it like that. And um, from the book of from the book of Acts chapter 10, from the book of Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power and how Jesus went around doing good and healing all those who were who oppressed, oppressed by the devil. And God was with him, you know. Jesus realizes the magnitude of the situation. And he says, you know, I cannot wait. I cannot sit and do a, a, a mission that is sitting, seated back, a lesser fair kind of ministry where, you know, I let things flow for themselves. I let people come to me. Of course, they would come to him because Jesus, of course, had been anointed with power. And, you know, there was all this crowd following him. But then he says, I will not sit down. So he went around doing good. He says, I will not sit back. He moves from town to town and he executes the mission of the Father. That is the calling that we have today, that we go out, we don't sit back, we don't relax, we use any tool we can so that we can execute the mission of the Father. And of course, you know, God can use many methods. God can use many methods to reach out with this ministry of reconciliation. He can you know, do thunder. You know, people like to associate God with thunder. He can probably approach it like that. He can choose and, and, and say, you know, oh, I am God, uh, you know, be reconciled to me. And of course, some people will, will listen because they, they are, there is this kind of terror. But by divine design, he has chosen to use you, the marvelous believer, to reach out. He knows that there, there is a world around each one of us. He would like us to use the world around us, uh, to use us. He would like to use us to impact the world around us. And that is why it says in verse 20 of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that, you know, therefore we are ambassadors of Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. God is making an appeal through us. You know, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God is using us as the tools. He is using us as the people that have been chosen to execute this mission of reconciliation. And I would like us to close with verse 21, which I mentioned that I like very much, that says, you know, God made him who knew no sin to be seen on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Wow. We have this whole divine backing in the sense that we have been made the righteousness of God. He made he who knew no sin to become sin. He is moved by love, you know. He loves the world so much. He is moved uh, by love. And he makes his son who knew no sin to become sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. So today I would like to just pray with you if you are not born again. I would like to just comment this ministry of reconciliation to you. God is looking for you to reconcile you with himself. You cannot continue living under the bondage of sin. You may have lived for a long time under the bondage of sin, but God is calling you today. He is calling you today so that you can move from the kingdom of darkness into the dominion of light. I would like you to just say a short prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I accept you as my savior. I accept that you came to reconcile me with God. I request you to be my God. I accept you as my personal Savior. From today, I am born again. Amen. 
Hallelujah. If you've prayed that prayer, look for a congregation of believers, people that know God, that have a relationship with God. Let them help you grow. Join the movement of the marvelous believers that are reaching out to the world with the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. 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 The ministry of reconciliation. I believe God is speaking to us, the marvelous believers. We've, we've had very many shows. We've encouraged each other, but I believe God also has seen we have, we have the strength, we have the stamina, we have been qualified to go out there and bring people to Christ. And so we thank God for the lesson that we've received today. Uh, we've been empowered. The Bible says God so anointed Jesus with power that wherever he went, he did good. And then the same Bible says, uh, for as many as received him, he gave them the power. And so we have been given the same power that Jesus had. And the Bible says he went out there doing good. So let's go out there. Let's... Uh, I like the verse that Eric has read, that it's as though God was speaking through us. It's as though God is um, pleading through us. It is rare that a man will die even for a good man, but Jesus died even for the ungodly. Let's go out there. Let's spread the good news, the good news of the kingdom, the love of the Father to as many as we can. And let's encourage one another, the marvelous believers, let's encourage one another that we have been empowered indeed that i believe was our lesson i believe god is speaking to us the marvelous believers that he has entrusted us with this ministry so let's not uh, let's not take it light it is as urgent as eric has put it. it we are men on a mission and the mission is urgent i believe we are blessed i believe we are challenged i believe uh, god has reminded that we have been empowered for this mission God bless you for watching us. This is the Marvelous Believers Show on Wema TV. We are so glad that you watch and let's meet next time. Amen.